Media Masters with Paul Blanchard. Welcome to Media Masters, a series of one-to-one interviews with people at the top of the media game. Today, I'm joined down the line from Montreal, Canada by Ashkan Kabasfrushan, founder and chief executive of WatchMojo, the world-leading producer of online video content. A winner of the Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award, Ashkan has built a company with a catalogue of 25,000 videos, which are seen 300 million times each month. With 17 billion all-time views and 40 million subscribers on YouTube, WatchMojo is one of the biggest global media brands built on the platform. Ashkan has written articles on business, sports and lifestyle for AOL, Yahoo and TechCrunch and is the author of three books, including Course to Success, Everything You Need to Succeed Beyond School. Ash, thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. I must be one of the people that's watched every single WatchMojo.com video. Uh, you know, I have it on all the time. I mean, last year it surpassed 100 billion minutes of watch time on YouTube. That must be a phenomenal achievement. It is. And I actually think, uh, coincidentally, I know we're known for our signature top 10 lists, even though I like to say we didn't invent the format, hat tip to Moses and his 10 commandments. But there's not more than, I suspect, 10 or so companies that have that much watch time. You know, that is a staggering number. Uh, You know, there are channels with more subscribers, more all time views, obviously. But that watch time is a testament to the quality and the passion of the community. So we're very proud of that. Talk our listeners through how you you started on your your entrepreneurial career. Then can we go back to the beginning? Because there's there's plenty to cover. But did you always envisage being a, a media entrepreneur and owner of one of the most prestigious brands online? No, I mean to be candid, I don't think most entrepreneurs, you know, kind of decide one day I'm going to be an entrepreneur. I think most entrepreneurs, humans, in fact, are driven by different kinds of insecurities. We all have our impulses, and I think for me it really boiled down to just wanting to walk to the beat of my own drum. You know, um, today you hear of even like the staunchest capitalist billionaires reference how like, for example, capitalism should do more, you know, you should have more of a stakeholder mindset. And I sincerely, uh, 15 years ago, 16 years ago, when I said, that's it, I'm going to venture into entrepreneurship. It really was to be able to treat employees, clients, community, in the way that I wanted to, to be not just treated, but also the way I just wanted to treat people. And for me, I felt like working for any other company, any other person, just constantly put me at odds in terms of principles. It's more a question of being master of your own destiny then, is it? Yeah, I mean, I think it's actually a bit of a paradox where you think you're in control of your destiny and nobody, like, the reality is that life is a paradox. Right. At the same time, everybody is to some extent in control of their destiny, meaning their future. But that doesn't mean I'm not unrealistic. That doesn't mean someone who is struggling, uh, working paycheck to paycheck could just tomorrow say, "Okay, I'm just going to take a leap of faith and start my own venture. But you could take a series of steps to put yourself in position. Right. So to, to answer your question, ultimately, you know, not to go all the way back, but at the end of the day, you know, 1999, I, I finished my studies in finance at a good business school, but the NASDAQ is about to crumble. The dot-com bubble will burst. Soon thereafter, 19 crazy guys get on a bunch of planes and smash them into symbols of business and, you know, military might in the U.S. And the reality was Wall Street was not going to roll out the carpet and hire Ashkan Karbas Frushan, an Iranian-born you know, atheist agnostic, but Muslim born Canadian with a so-so report card. You know what I mean? So for me, it was more just a reality of, okay, I had this preconceived notion in my mind that I was going to be an investment banker, an analyst covering stocks, you know, focused on the world of media, but that was just not going to happen. But what I realized, and this is the key to being a good entrepreneur, or one of the keys is you have to be aware. You know, you have to have an open mind. So I was like, look, why would I need to do a couple of years in corporate or traditional roles if in the end this internet revolution is going to just sweep across all industries? So I ended up reluctantly accepting a job at a search engine that was relatively unknown called Mama. Mama was actually quite big when Google was in beta. So I got my first taste of startups and I loved it. It didn't matter what your background was. It didn't matter what your name was. It didn't matter how much experience you had. You just had to kind of hustle. You had to show up wanting to do more today than you did yesterday. 
And if you did that, opportunities would open up. Now, that's not to say that there's not injustice and there's not politics. There are in any organization. But for me, as a very driven, ambitious young man, it was a better environment than a corporate environment. So once I was in a startup environment, I very quickly realized that I wasn't as passionate about technology in a vacuum. Technology to me was a means to an end. You know, like I don't really get excited when I see a hammer or a drill, but if I could use that hammer and a drill to build something for my daughter, let's say, then I value that hammer, right? So technology, I was not one of these guys that was going to toil away building a better mousetrap. But I also felt somewhat from a strategy and competition perspective from risk return sense, I felt like technology was too binary. You either won or you lost. If you won, you got a crazy amount of upside. But if you go back to what I said earlier about a stakeholder mindset instead of a shareholder mindset, I was never driven to be the, the wealthiest guy. But I did want people to think Ash is the most principled guy. You know, I wanted people to be like, Ash has integrity, Ash has character. If we have a problem, you know, I fancied myself like a young King Solomon or King Cyrus. I wanted to be fair. I wanted to be just. But of course, when you're 21, 22, you have no experience, right? So who's going to come to you? So it was a lot of methodically wanting to be in the room when problems were being discussed to be able to present solutions. Because I always felt if ultimately you're solving problems, then you create value. You, you address pain that others are feeling. And then over time, you could get something out of it, perhaps. But it starts like that. You know, you got to give to take. You can't just be me, me, me all the time. And so, and about a little parentheses, when I was in college, I was actually working in customer service for a bank, their credit card department. And finance students, we all had this big chip on our shoulder thinking we were like masters of the universe when we had no experience. And I really loved the service industry. I had been a waiter. I, you know, when friends came over, I'd like to cook. So that was also the sentiment. Like if somebody said, what is your statement of purpose? I'd say it's here to serve, right? So I was always very much customer service oriented, whether it was like helping a colleague or a client. And so when I was at Mama, the market just tumbled and slowly but surely they start to let people go. And I actually surprisingly went to my bosses and I said, who are the CEO and the CFO of the company? And I was like, look, if you guys are at a point now where you're letting go salespeople, it seems a bit weird that you're retaining me. And I understand why, because I'm basically your support, but it seems like not exactly optimal. And I won't lie, it's not just pure altruism. I've met, or more like I've ran into three guys that I went to school with, and they've launched an online men's magazine, what, what they call in, in the UK, the Lad Max. So these guys had launched an online magazine called Ask Men. And Ask Man was essentially like, you know, some people would have called it the poor man's maxim, which we kind of took slight offense to, but it also obviously emboldened us. So if you look at the backdrop in 2000 to 2005, when I was there, all of the traditional magazines had been lured initially by the dot-com bubble in the late 90s. And then the correction when the dot-com bubble burst kind of vindicated them. So they retrenched. By retrenching, it opened up a vast opportunity for us. So we started to write a lot of articles and we would effectively just go take the best columns in Maxim, Men's Health, Playboy, GQ. We had no nudity on by design, but we would write about relationships and we would write about you know management and leadership. And it was funny that a bunch of young 20 somethings in Montreal, which is a very cosmopolitan city and we're all global in our, in our worldview, but it was very weird that us young 20 somethings were effectively writing these articles, giving advice to men all over the world. And I was writing, I love to write. I didn't know I loved to write, but I realized I wasn't just an executive entrepreneur, but I was also a storyteller. So I would be writing the young professional column under my name, and I would be writing dating advice under another name, and I would be writing travel articles under another. And that's where I also realized, as much as I like to write like essay style um, columns, I realized I loved also top 10 lists because people would read the top 10 list, even if they weren't necessarily interested in the topic, but they would only read an article if they were interested in the topic. So it just gave me a much bigger audience, which I, which I like. And so from 2000 to 2005, I had probably, false modesty aside, one of like the greatest runs from any storyteller like ever. I probably wrote thousands of articles. I wrote two books, my first one being Course to Success, Everything You Need to Succeed Beyond School, my second one being The Confessions of Alexander the Great, 33 Lessons in Greatness, which is effectively his autobiography as if he would have written it, where he kind of takes you through his journey and, you know, the son of a, 
of a of a king who you know seeks to go out and avenge you know the the Persian Empire's attack on on ancient Greece and all of that. So it's kind of like a it was a unique take, obviously. And and I just wrote and wrote and wrote. And then by two thousand four two thousand five, Askman began to get inquiries from other companies who wanted to buy it. I had met my current wife, then girlfriend, and it just the timing was right for me to finally kind of embrace my destiny and say, you know what? I start off as an executive. I found my voice as a storyteller. I've been an entrepreneur leading a lot of projects internally, but it's now time for me to turn the page and kind of become a full-fledged entrepreneur. And at the age of 27, the same age that Hugh Hefner was when he launched Playboy, uh, my wife and I basically launched Watch Mojo in late 2005. Um, and then we recruited three guys, and the five co-founders are all still working together 15 years later. How did he feel? I mean, obviously, it could have gone wrong. So was there an, an element of trepidation? Was it bravery? Did you, did you have a backup plan, or were you all in on plan A rather than plan B? I mean, where, where were you? I mean, it's easy now, because you made a huge success of it to look back and say, well, it was inevitable. But back then, you, did, you didn't know it was inevitable. It could have failed. Oh, and that's half of it. So three months after we launched, about 15 years ago to the very day, I heard a knock on the door. And I was like, who is there? I opened the door. It was a bailiff. It was a bailiff serving me with a motion for an injunction to shut us down, ultimately served by none other than Rupert Murdoch, whose company News Corp and Fox had effectively acquired IGN, which was the company that had bought Ask Men. And when I left Ask Men, I did the right thing, which was basically to fold in my sales duties into IGN's much bigger sales force. And I didn't want to play turf battles and I didn't want to drag it out. So I finished the calendar year and we agreed to part ways. There was really no role for me. You know, there were some roles, but it was always complicated. So I just kind of bowed out. And they said, look, we don't want you to go to our competition. So if IGN competes with GameSpot, not to be confused with GameStop, which is the retail store. Um, don't go working for them, for example. And if Ask Man competes with, say, Maxim, don't go work for Maxim. But if you go anywhere else, we're fine. And sure, if you start a company, maybe we'll even invest. So when I left, I had a non-competition that basically said, don't launch another men's magazine. So I said, okay, let's not write any text to make sure we don't upset the mighty news corp let's launch a video content company because that's the future. Audiences have already moved online. That will continue. We're now in the third wave of video content storytellers. In the late 90s, Steven Spielberg, for example, launched pop.com. That was the first wave, but there was no broadband. Consumer adoption was in there. Um, in the second wave, after the dot-com bubble burst, you had companies like Heavy, and we were in the third wave. And so when I got served, it really spoke to both, wow, people are just mean and vindictive and petty. But I also realized, yeah, you know what? People have their own insecurities and people have their own impulses and I'm not, I can't control how other people feel and react. So that was one takeaway. Another takeaway, which is something I'd experienced always, you know, I was always popular in, in high school. I had, you know, like great friends, you know, dated very nice ladies, you know, I kind of, because I was always a good speaker and I was like athletic and all that, like I had no problem fitting in. But at the end of the day, when your name is Ashkan Karbis Fushan going up in, in Canada um, and, and your country, like you grow up, you're, you're born in Iran, but you grew up and I joke that I'm as Muslim as a BLT, a bacon, lettuce, and tomato sandwich. You know, like my culture internally was always North American and Western, but you know, your name and your background. And like, I remember one of the reasons why I've always, for example, been so respectful to women, I like to think anyway, is, you know, my first recollection of Iran was the movie, Not Without My Daughter, which is basically a Western lady played by Sally Field who marries an Iranian. Uh, they go back to Iran, and obviously, this, as the story you could imagine, they, you know, she's not allowed to leave. And, uh, you know, I was probably 10 or something when I see this. I'm like, okie dokie, you know, so I was like, this is how my, my, my people are portrayed. Okay. Then you open up history books, and you're like, ooh, there was this hostage-taking scenario, which, sure, you could go back and say, you know, an eye for an eye, we're all blind. But I was like, yeah, that's not cool. You shouldn't be storming that. So, admittedly, myself, I had this insecurity, so to speak, 
And I told you, you want to go deep? We'll go deep, you know? So I kind of realized that, hey, I've always effectively been a bit of an outsider. I've always had to defend myself. I go, wow, maybe one of the reasons why I was always kind of had a cool high school life was because the first time somebody would kind of try to pick on me, I wouldn't need to just fight back physically. I could kind of dismantle them. You know, I now even say the pen is mightier than the sword, you know, and we'll get to how, how that was manifested. But so I just made a decision that I, I remember talking to lawyers and they were like, look, you might prevail at the merits. They're seeking an injunction to shut you down until a trial alleging that you're competing with them. But we don't think you're competing with them. The problem is you got to get to the merits. You got to get to the trial. They could just show up at the injunction and just outspend you. And we all sat back and we was like, oh, so like the only way I could prevail at this stage is if I represent myself. And there was this kind of like awkward laugh. Well, then guess what happened the ensuing Monday? Show up to court. Sure. Some moments were reminiscent of a Mr. Bean episode where I'm kind of like not standing in the right place, not <laughs> what I should. But I wasn't overconfident. I was confident. I wasn't crazy. I spoke to a couple of injunction lawyers. I did my homework. I set aside emotion as much as I wanted to get there and hurl every insult at them. I didn't. I said, my lady, I'm here to argue that petitioners have not met the four tests of an interlocutory injunction. And they went white. They were like, uh-oh, Ash has done his homework. You know, they spoke for about 30, 40 minutes. I spoke for an hour and a half. And I just dismantled every paragraph of every argument. You know, uh, petitioners claim that watch mojo may cause harm. Well, my lady, may cause harm is not a risk. You cannot shut us down over a possibility that in the future we may cause harm. It was theater. I loved it. I demolished them. But despite that, they sought to continue. So in the end, I kind of found emails that kind of disproved a lot of what they said. And they, they one by one, all of the IGN units, so IGN, um, you know, MySpace at the time, they all signed up as partners. Hulu, Hulu was a joint venture between NBC and Fox, and they all kind of start to take our content. So I, I very early really believe that if you are patient and if you kind of buy into, not that everything is meant to be, like being too kumbaya, but if you understand, and I'm not a religious person, you could say I'm spiritual, but I just said, if you firmly believe that things happen for a reason, um, you can't rush outcomes, you know? So I could not get Watch Mojo to where it is today. I knew it was gonna be a very long slog. And in many ways, the trial hurt me financially, emotionally, you know, reputationally to some, I'm sure. But it's one of the reasons why Watch Mojo went on to become so successful. Um, and the fact that that lawsuit scared off some of the investors early on, again, even though it was very painful near term, the long term, it allowed me to keep control and build the kind of company and culture that I wanted. So no, um, even without the operational risks of starting a video company in 2006, when it was extremely premature, right? At that point, when we were producing videos for YouTube, my, my accountants and lawyers were like, do you want us to introduce you to a psychiatry, uh, you know, psychiatrist? Because why are you doing this? Why are you producing content for YouTube? But it all, it all, and in the end, work worked out. But definitely, when you start on this journey, expect a lot of obstacles. What came next? So let's set the mood. It's 2006. What happened in 2007? By then, the the lawsuit was behind me. I ran out of money in December of 2007. I had a quarter million dollars, which is the seed money I put in. That was the money I got selling Ask Men, uh, my share of it. I ran out of money. So I then had to make a decision, shut down or go into debt. I went into debt. But then making matters worse, Lehman blew up. It took down the entire financial system. But again, in that, what happened was some of our competition just kind of threw in the towel. And it allowed us to kind of go through this nuclear winter of 2008, 2009, 2010, where a lot of the hype, a lot of the fads, a lot of like the BS in any industry that sometimes distracts entrepreneurs, that evaporated. All of a sudden, we could just put our head down and just produce content and sign distribution deals. And it was to our advantage because companies now were fearful of investing money, meaning increasing their expenses. And in online video, the revenues were not just like hard to predict, they were embryonic, there was no revenue. 
Whereas being in Montreal and me playing basically the chief storyteller, chief executive, chief counsel, chief bottle washer, the janitor role, and we had a great team, we had a small team, we kept our costs down. I didn't pay myself for six years. I don't even know how that happened, but I didn't really pay myself for six years. And I ended up racking up another $700,000 plus in debt. I mortgaged my place. My wife and I decided to mortgage our place instead of letting anybody go. Um, people don't know that. I mean, the new people, the new staff. And I, that's not their, you know, it's not for them to know or care. It's, it predates them. But that's also one of the things that stings me over time, that people don't appreciate the sacrifices. And people don't really, are not even aware of what it takes to give yourself an opportunity to be successful, let alone be successful. Um, you know, time and time again, we forewent near-term gain for ourselves to just create the culture we wanted, create jobs. You know, as, a, as an entrepreneur, I'm really driven by brand building, community building. As an investor, I've always been driven by job creation, you know, like what is the right policy for a government? So I've always been driven by other things, right? And so as an entrepreneur, that's kind of goes back to why I got in this racket. Because I didn't want to just go, I work at a corporation, ergo, I must do A, B, and C because that's what their shareholders want. I was like, look, I'm on this planet one time. We've seen with this pandemic, at any moment, it could be over. So what's the life you want to live? You know, what's the legacy you want to leave? What kind of impact do you want to have, right? And for me, it was always very different. And life is a paradox because I ended up having a lot of success, even though I wasn't really chasing it. So by 2011, I would say we had kind of like stretched out, like I was literally, I remember getting a factoring uh, deal in place and factoring for listeners who may not be you know, aware of it. It's just like, let's say you run an invoice for a client and they pay you in 90 days, but the factoring company pays you right away and they'll take 2% a month or something like that. It's a high interest rate. I remember the gentleman who ran the factoring company kind of wanting to test me and he said, okay, what happens here and this happens and what you can't pay us? Like, what are you going to do? And I guess he was kind of expecting me eventually to be like, well, I'll run out of town or too bad, screw you. And I was just kind of going through different scenarios. I was like, maybe I can call the bank, maybe do this. Maybe I could go back to investors who pass and do that. And he was like, you're the first person that like kept looking for a solution to pay us back. He's like, we're taking you on as a client. You seem to be quite honest, right? But so by 2011 though, no amount of honesty and principles was going to balance the books. We were basically totally run out of money. I remember, ironically, not having taken any vacation, finally saying, okay, since we're at the end of the road, I added a, a vacation down south with my wife and two very young daughters at the time, just to kind of get away from the cold and all that in, in the Canadian winter. And I was in the pool and I felt this like paralysis where I was like, I'm going to go back to Montreal and I'm going to have to let some people go. And I've really, it's a shame because I've really done so much to avoid this, but there's just, it's the end of the road. But that week, I vividly remember sending two notes to two leads, two possible clients. And it's all in my third book, The Tenure Overnight Success, An Entrepreneur's Manifesto, How Watchmojo Built the Most Successful Media Brand on YouTube. And I basically emailed these two companies and I kind of just, you know, not, not in a panic or anything, just kind of said, hey, let me know if you guys would be willing to, you know, kind of sign that deal that we've been discussing, et cetera, et cetera. And to my surprise, they both did. So we had an educational client in Germany called Papagai. And then we had this uh, ad network in the US called Grab. And they basically gave me a lifeline that bought us just enough time to get to the break even, which finally happened in 2011. And then to 2012, we were profitable. And we've been profitable since then. And in many ways, you know, you kind of replace one set of problems with a knot, with another. And it's really just a reminder that like, and it's a great life. It's a great life. You know what they say about entrepreneurship? It's, you, you, it's entrepreneurship is living a few years of your life like few people want to, to be able to live the rest of your life like few can. It's, I've, I've like always that. been the same. I've never had a job. I would yeah. rather work 80 hours a week for myself than 37 hours a week for someone else. But isn't that the paradox? Because I feel like I'm still very much, but maybe that's my personality, working for others. And I don't mind that, but it's at least under the right conditions. I basically feel like I work for my employees, for my clients, for the community. Service leadership. Service leadership. And I like that, but that's what my point is. It's a great, great life of privilege, but it's a life where you're constantly like monkey barring from one headache or heartbreak to another, you know, and that's fine because this is what I've realized employees 
do not have that service leadership uh, at, the, at the same scale that entrepreneurs do. The most successful entrepreneurs have never really woken up, I feel, and said, you know, what's in it for me? There's always this kind of like indirect two-step worldview. You know, I'm not saying eventually that doesn't change and people's priorities don't change. But so one thing I learned was like, hey, the first five or maybe 10, maybe even 12 employees, yeah, you know what, I count them, as, for sure, I've counted them as family, you know, I'm responsible for them, and, and, you know, I've worked with them for 15 years of my life, but for me, it was me, I was the problem into thinking, well, why would the employee number 28 or employee number 42, why do I expect them to view me as family? And that's when I also realized, I go, yeah, it's true, a corporation is not your family, it might be your community, it might be your team. But I also kind of had to grow up and I had to mature, you know, and I kind of realized as I read more and just kind of look at others and I go, yeah, it's true. Like an effective leader has five, maybe 10 reports. I used to tell every employee, my inbox is open, my doors open. And it is, I literally once a week send out emails like, Hey guys, if you have any feedback on anything, here's the town hall form and submit to me any, you know, any feedback you have suggestions. It's like cricket because they're not going to be comfortable the way the first five or 10 employees were to come in and say, Ash, you're wrong. Ash, why are we doing this? Ash, I have an idea, right? So this is why it's like a constant journey where every day you're teaching others, but you're also learning. And like the greatest teachers are perpetual students, right? So it's, it's, it's a life that I love. I'm very proud. Um, but, but it's also a very kind of like restless existence. You know, I wish, I used to hear... Ozzy Osbourne talking about Sharon Osbourne. And he would say, when I met Sharon, Sharon, when I met Sharon, um, she finally brought some peace of mind. And I remember when I met my spouse, I was like, yeah, it's true. She's the first person that I could just kind of eventually, you know, tune out, just relax, just enjoy the moment. And I'm, I'm back right away. I'm always thinking I'm too many ideas in my mind. What's a typical week look like for you? I mean, what without sounding sort of rude about it, what do you do? You know, what's your job? If if you had a sort of mapped out a typical week as a pie chart, what are the the segments? How big are they? You know, some of it business development, management, financial stuff, and also what's top of your to do list at the moment? And I I don't mean in terms of taking the laundry, like the yeah. the, the small stuff. Today. I mean, like, where's the next big step that you're going to take things? If you don't mind me asking. No, I love that question. That's a great question. Okay, so the reality is, I think if you go back to my customer service days and just that sort of leadership, but also really wanting like kind of, you know, as an entrepreneur, you're ultimately a player coach. Um, you're always a player coach. So I fundamentally am blessed to have a great team, right? I mean, I'm very flattered. I think one of the things I'm proudest of is one of them is never having had to do layoffs due to financial reasons, because I think I've been prudent, disciplined and you know, hey, if you're willing to mortgage your place, which most people aren't for your team, you could imagine then, you know, once you're generating profits, you think twice of letting people go. So I'm very proud of that. But I'm also really proud, even prouder of the fact that it's the same five co-founders. And like, we have 10 employees that have been with us for 12, 13 years, which is unheard of in, in 2021. You know, it's like, I can't name me any company where that is the case. So I'm very proud of that. But that also means that it's a great team that I've kind of coached and delegated. So I would say in the core business, the core operations, I'm just an occasional problem solver where one of my execs lieutenants would come to me and he or she would, would describe an opportunity or a problem and I'll ask them a few questions and then I go, okay, well, here's how I would go about it. Or I would like kind of reference like, hey, remember when we did this was similar and you know this was some of the takeaways and if we have to do it again. And it's a very, you know, we joke, hashtag live and learn. We don't blame anybody, it's all good. You know, we don't have that kind of culture where we point fingers. So I'm kind of just a sounding board for um, a given problem or opportunity. And it's usually planned out where I have weekly calls. I've realized that throwing people in the pool and assuming they're going to swim is probably not a good idea. So like, you know, Thursdays, I'll talk to one of my lieutenants in the afternoon. Mondays, I'll speak to another. And then I got a bunch of meetings where oftentimes I'll actually be very quiet and just listen, which I can do once in a while. Other times I'm like, I need to get there and rah, 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 tell them that, hey, you know, we got to step up and we got to, you know, sometimes as a coach, I'll be like, come on, you know, we got to play more. We got to finish our plays. I'll never yell at somebody. But yeah, sometimes I'm like, people are asleep. People need to wake up. I'm like, come on, guys, you know, the competition's going to kill us. What are you guys doing? You know, but it's never, 
Johnson, you're an idiot. That, that doesn't work. That's not effective. But saying, hey, guys, we really got to play more and we got to finish your plays. If you don't finish your play, you're out of position. And then I'm out of position. And then they come back, they score on us. We let down the team. You know, it's kind of like that works. That shtick, I feel people do need a little bit of a jolt sometimes. But it never works if you're just kind of berating people. And that's not the culture I want. And I don't think, you know, that's not being a good human being. But that's like, I would say, half. The other half is just new frontiers. In life, you have the starters, you have the finishers, but you also have the people in the middle, right? You need all those. So even though I'm a good starter, I, I probably start too many things. I realize I'm a great finisher, but you can only finish. It's like I play striker when I play football and it's like I, I score a ton of goals. I'll score like 20 goals in a 10 game season. But I go, look, it's a big net. You guys did all the work. You brought the ball up. You made all the deeks. You dribbled. You got out everybody out of position. And then the ball came to me and I took a shot. And it was a huge net, right? Like you guys literally did the work. And I mean that. But the point is, I have to balance all the crazy ideas because we did get to a point in about 2016, 17, 18, where I was coming up with like four ideas an hour and expecting my team to do even one a day, let's say, you know, so it was like an insane amount of ideas and initiatives and still an insane amount of projects to want to implement. And I would say sometime in 2019, 20, frankly, 2019 as a decade was ending, I just switched gears. I was 41 but I just turned 40. So I was kind of just thinking, but I was fundamentally just saying, you know, Ash, you really need to switch gears and focus more on gratitude than expectations. And I wasn't expecting things in terms of material objects or money. I didn't care about that, but accomplishments, right? So the great musician Prince, Prince was ultimately not into formulaic repetition. And you could, I'm not comparing myself to Prince, let's be very clear here. But in many ways, I think because we've become known for the top 10 guys, which is a formula, all content is a formula, whether you're the Wall Street Journal, whether you're the BBC, you know, whether you are Fox, every, every content you know, company ev eventually develops, you know, the way VCs talk about product market fit, storytellers eventually have a platform format fit, you know, like American Idol, it's a format or a given platform. So watch Mojo, I think, again, going back to those insecurities, I'm not driven by like bad insecurities, like, oh, my, my neighbor has a bigger car or a bigger house. That I could care less about. But wanting to leave, you know, a, a legacy, having impact, helping others. You know, I'm, I have this disease effectively where I'm constantly trying to help others and I want to eliminate people's pain. You know, if I see a, I remember like, if I see a single mother at the airport kind of clearing customs and she's got bags on her kid, I would literally be like, oh my God, I got to drop everything and go help her bag to get across the, the you know, the, the whatever, the gates or something. If I'm at a restaurant and I see somebody next to me doesn't have a fork, I'll literally give them my unused fork. You know what I mean? Even though now I don't have a fork. And I tend to do that a lot with my colleagues and I had to stop. I had to stop projecting that they were, you know, that they could do everything or that everything was possible. I really had to kind of go, hey, Everybody has a comparative advantage to quote Plato. Everybody has a, you know, the principle of specialization. This person is good at this. Position them on the field to do that. If they're a great midfielder, that's the position they should play. But putting them in goal, guess what? We're going to give up six goals. This person, I actually reference them as eagles and turkeys. It's complimentary. Both eagles and turkeys are great animals. Very different, or birds. Very different. If you think an eagle is a turkey and vice versa, you are an, an ineffective manager. So you also have to recognize, right? So to answer your question, I am also always constantly judiciously trying to expand our horizons, my personal horizons, my personal professional uh, ambitions inside and outside of Watch Mojo, and you know, making sure that Watch Mojo doesn't shrink because ultimately every company eventually um, goes through a mature stage and eventually a decline. And unless you reinvent yourself in one way or another, you will not be spared that end game. You mentioned your book, how Watch Mojo built the most successful media brand on YouTube. I was reading it and, and you wrote that when people ask you about Watch Mojo, you tell them that you ran out of ways to fail and that's why it succeeded. You also wrote that you want to be the most admired media company in the world. How would you gauge that? Sure, I mean, look, I don't wanna sit here and like trash Hollywood. I don't, I've learned a lot from Hollywood. Hollywood has always been a source of frustration for me because it is like the bizarre world of like the digital, you know, digital is more collaborative. 
it was it drew a lot of like the the crazies and the misfits at the beginning of the 21st century and frankly i would say those who stuck in the industry and stuck with the industry to see it through the nuclear winter they were all like kind of like innovative or misfits or, or like kind of different thinkers and then obviously today digital is like everything look at disney they blew up their model forced to some extent and accelerated by covid but ultimately they blew up their traditional model to embrace digital but when you look at the big companies and I say this very respectfully because I learn a lot from these companies and they've done tremendous things from a product, from content, from strategy, job creation. I mean, impact and culture. You know what I mean? Like I'm not sitting here criticizing anybody for like their output, so to speak. But in terms of their principles, I mean, Harvey Weinstein is one example. There was this other guy. What was his name? Scott Rudin. Yeah, Scott Rudin last week. Who I, my ignorance for not knowing who he was, I'd obviously heard about him. Like very influential and most people may not even. But the quote was like, everyone just knows he's an absolute monster, end quote. What kind of wretched, what kind of like backward industry looks the other way? You know, like you've seen the Me Too movement kind of call out the injustice. I'm not sure that much has changed though. And then you see the talk about the lack of representation. Again, I'm not sure if much is going to change. And there's other things. There's many other things. So it's like being in the media industry, for example, right? I mean, I'm not talking about like the plastic industry or the tire industry, because that's far removed from what I do. But you asked me about being media. Yeah, what I want is I acknowledge for Watch Mojo to be the biggest company means you have to take on a lot of organizational risk. We did not have me two things, thank God, knock on wood, partly because, yeah, my, I mean, first of all, I'm a decent human being. I remember when I was a, I was a teacher's assistant lecturing finance. I was 20, 21. You know, I would go out and party like every self-respecting student, but that was probably the first time that power dynamics became clear to me, where you had male and female students. But I remember a lot of like the female students that would come and they would sometimes be like, oh, I need help with my exam can you help me i was like look i'm really busy i'm working and they would sometimes be like oh you know i could come to your house i was like um no i was like it's it's good i don't think you should come to my apartment it's weird you know i'm i'm not just a classmate i'm let's ta you know so i was like that's not a good so it's kind of i was like putting myself out of those situations if you think then of like when I started the company, we had a lot of attractive women show up wanting to be hosts and wanting to be in camera. And we had to be very clear to be like respectful and not to abuse our position. And again, not, and to me, this was like the bare minimum. I'm not sitting here to be clear bragging. I'm just saying what kind of wretched, horrible human being do you have to be? And what industry do you work in where this stuff goes on and these SOBs just accept it? And then they have the audacity to come and question my principles and my character where I kind of maybe just for day-to-day -day operations kind of am a bit assertive or aggressive just within ethical parameters to just succeed and just to win as an organization. So as I get older at 43, not having played the traditional way of like raising VC money, you know, kind of having a corporation become a partner where I kind of have to all of a sudden say, oh, this person is amazing just because they stuffed a bunch of money in my pocket. Yeah, my objective going on is to show young students who want to aspire to be builders, show entrepreneurs that there is another way. You don't have to be Uber where you had a toxic culture, but there's a trade-off. If you want scale for scale's sake, that means you're going to take on more cultural risk. You may not be able to stay on top of abusive behavior, sexual you know, abuse or discrimination and all that. And so it's to say these things come at a cost. There is a trade-off. If you want to be huge, you may one day wake up and there's a story that's written about some crazy thing that happened that maybe you didn't even know, but as the head of the organization, I got news for you, you're responsible for. You know, people don't like this, but one of the reasons why, I mean, we have departments that handle administrative matters, but one of the things that I always wanted to still flow to me was HR. I'm not saying I'm the HR manager, that does not really make sense, but I wanted to make sure that I didn't have 
for example, any possible human resource issues kind of swept under the rug and like, oh, let's not tell Ash about this. I'm like, no, 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 no. Tell Ash about this because you got to lead by example. And it goes back to being respected and being admired. You know, there's a lot of stuff that goes on that industries just accept. And like, I'm 43. When I look at 20 year olds, it's like very easy to blast millennials and it's very easy to blast Gen Y, Gen Z, whatever. But I go, you know what? There's sure they're going to figure things out. And maybe sometimes they're too idealistic. Sometimes there's naivete and we're all like that at one point. But I go, you know, it's, it's, there are good parts about how they view the world. And I'm hoping that before they become jaded, and say, oh, well, it's normal. Harvey Weinstein did this. So I'm going to look the other way. No, 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 don't look the other way. When you see injustice, you have to act. You don't have to get in line and kick the poor guy who's maybe autistic and couldn't defend himself. So he got bullied. No, you could totally break that chain, right? So the most admired and respected is nuanced. Yes, obviously, people are like, you guys make the best top 10 lists. Okay. One day I'd like them to say, wow, you guys did the greatest scripted show or the greatest reality TV show or the greatest book and all that. But it's really just in terms of like at the most fundamental basis, just being a decent human being and, you know, empathy and being sympathetic to others who may not have it as well as you. do. What's your relationship with YouTube like? Because it's a, it must be a symbiotic relationship, like a marriage, because you know, you're they're one of their most popular content providers. One of the reasons I subscribe to the premium YouTube is because I love watching the watchmojo.com lists. But on the other hand, without them, you don't have access to those millions of viewers. So is it is it just like a like a marriage where there's ups and downs and tensions? But frankly, you both need each other. You need their platform. And without your amazing content, they don't have anything to put on the platform. Or it's certainly not sticky as uh, people aren't gonna come back as readily. The YouTube dynamic as you allude to it as a marriage is a fascinating one i think i've always been very vocal to say that youtube's always been in a between a rock and a hard place it's a fascinating platform and i've always said that it's the platform like watch mojo is the house that youtube built so i've always tried to be very respectful and very appreciative and you know as much as i say i grew up in canada being born in Iran, we have this like kind of cultural disposition, which is like kind of like extreme etiquette. Like you're very courteous, you're very polite. Um, it's called tarof. In any case, I wrote an article about it and how it manifests into management style. But the point is, I've been on the one hand, extremely courteous, extremely kind of like diplomatic. But yeah, there are moments when I am sure over the last 15 years, and I would say sometime between 2015 to 18, 19, where they were like, yeah, watch Mojo, great, great channel, fun content, but Ash is crazy. Like, I'm sure there were times when they're like, what is wrong with Ash? But I'll explain. So there's an expression, I hope it's still politically correct to say it. If it's not, I apologize. It's called the Mexican standoff. What's a Mexican standoff? It's like when there's three people pointing guns at one another, right? So my 15 years has basically been that on YouTube where there's YouTube, which is a platform that adheres to the DMCA and the four safe harbors that protect them when people upload content. If the uploader doesn't have the right, for example, YouTube can say, look, we, we are not responsible. And then you have rights holders on the other side. And then there's a bifurcation where there's the watch mojos of the world who are producing content. But given where the world is, you sometimes also have companies like Watch Mojo that actually kind of create mashups featuring third-party content, which under fair use in the US or fair dealing in the UK, Australia, and Canada is perfectly legal. But because YouTube is a for-profit platform, I admit, and I've always said this to be fair to them, that they don't have a responsibility to perfectly mirror copyright law. They get to determine what their policy is according to their risk profile. And YouTube was always tilting the floor towards rights holders, but also the intermediaries that those rights holders sometimes hire to manage their intellectual property. So if somebody uploads, you know, a five minute portion of a football match, yeah, and that's probably infringing. So, you know, 
the premiership could hire a firm to issue a takedown. When Watch Mojo does top 10 funny characters, we might show The Simpsons, we may show South Park, we may show Peppa Pig. That is basically exempt from copyright, 100 years of precedent, many you know, instances of case law that support our argument. But because YouTube is ultimately a robot, like Content ID is a machine, they inadvertently early on tilted the level, the, the playing field, like unfairly towards us. So even if Fox, like an employee at Fox would say, yeah, Watch Mojo is fair use, because everything was so automated, we would oftentimes get tripped up and get these claims. Now, the way I said everything happens for a reason. So if you go back to the injunction that I had to defend, the four tests are balance of inconvenience, meaning eventually when a judge looks at this, who is more likely to prevail? And in our case, if our videos are prima facie at face value at first glance, fair use, it's unfair for our videos to be taken down because at the merit stage, we would prevail. Two, there's this concept of irreparable harm. Well, guess what? Our video of the top 10 comedy characters does not cause irreparable harm to Fox and so on. But so I played a big part behind the scenes to diligently and diplomatically without burning a bridge with YouTube or the rights holders, ergo that Mexican standoff reference, where I had to basically get YouTube to reflect the law and not just what their risk profile was. And I would say in the past couple of years, it's definitely become more smooth, knock on wood. I've also delegated this more because I felt I needed to remove myself where whenever there would be these frivolous claims, YouTube would recognize that they were ultimately frivolous, but they had to process them in their order. But because Watch Mojo was massive and we were producing five videos a day and publishing a ton of content, and I was responsible for not just 40, 50 full-time employees, but a hundred freelancers. So I had like, like 500 extra dependents that ultimately, given my disposition, I felt responsible for. Go back to what I said. I'm the guy that mortgaged my house to keep losing money to keep the company all together, right? Like it wasn't like I'm not a normal person in that sense. I admittedly was under tremendous pressure because I feared that our channel could go down, not because we're doing anything wrong, but because of like an administrative decision by like an employee in like YouTube's legal department that was probably making more in a year that we were making in a year. You know what I mean? So that was both, it was a bit of a love and hate. I would always talk glowingly about them as a platform. I would always say that like more so than Facebook, they were a more positive member of like the creator community. You know, I always talked about how they, their intentions were awesome, but behind there was always this friction regarding how they interpreted copyright law and how they managed things through content ID. And I wrote some articles and I wrote, created some videos that got a little bit of traction and buzz, kind of not whistleblowing anybody. Again, I had to be careful not to bite the hand that feeds, but it was a tremendously um, tense, crazy 15 years. And at the end of this year, after the pandemic, I, I launched contextisking.com just to kind of like go back to writing. and it kind of hit me that I kind of suffered through effectively like post-traumatic stress disorder going from starting the company, being sued by effectively my former partners in a very frivolous manner. It's fine, I, I, I forgive, I may not forget clearly, but I forgive and it's all good. Um, then like losing money, uh, you know, running out of money and then kind of employees and all this other stuff. And then like, even once you're successful and like rights holders generally like what we did, it was marketing for them, you know, they liked it. You had YouTube that was always kind of putting you on the brink of extinction. And it was like, it was just a lot of anxiety and stress. And that's also when I kind of realized, hey, you can walk away from this, Ash. Like, you've made enough money. You could retire. You, you're not driven by money. So it's not like some people that just want to make more money. So your outlook has to change. You know, I was like, ultimately, YouTube's a business. YouTube's going to do what makes sense for YouTube. And you, Ash, you have all these problems that are, in fact, a function of your privilege. So you need to have perspective here. Either you laugh about these things or you let it get you. But if you let it get you, then what's the point? What's the purpose at the end of the day, right? So I think, and that's what I mean, that like we do control how we react to things. 
I'm not saying we control what happens to us. I'm not saying life's fair and all that. But I do think as individuals, like we get at least to choose how we react to things. And, you know, I'm not saying you can make a flip a switch and change things, but you can at least make progressive changes that are incremental that get you to where you want to be. The old adage in poker, isn't it, is that you can't control the hand that you're dealt, but you can control the way it's played. Exactly. Very well taken. I mean, I find it inspirational as a fellow entrepreneur, Ash, that, you know, you, you've been so candid in saying, you know, you ran out of money and you were staring, you know, over the cliff into the abyss. And now you've sort of turned that round. Is it right that you employ 50 full-time employees in Montreal, New York City, LA and London? You know, what is next for you in terms of your expansion plans? Because, I mean, it's an incredible organization and, and company that you, you've created. No, I'm very proud of it. Um, I think I probably was naive so in 2016 we went all the way above we, we got to like almost 60 ish full-time employees and we've always had 100 200 freelancers and bear in mind like these freelancers canada is not like the us you know we have like a health system so there's a lot of people that we would love to bring on full-time that sometimes they're like no they want the independence so it's not like in the us where companies are kind of pushing people to be freelance now that said we also have a lot of jobs that are freelance work contract work so but but i do view my point is i do view our family or the army or community as the whole sure there are these full-time employees who i kind of know more i know their families i know their faces you know what i mean but i still have always viewed our freelancers as an extension. To me, they're not that different. Ultimately, I'm responsible for them. You know, I, I lead that kind of like, you know, broader army, so to speak. And I kind of have to lead by example and I'm, you know, I, I'm responsible and I need to be accountable to them. So, but let me tell you a, a very painful kind of when I say entrepreneurship is one heartbreak after another. So in 2016, it was 10 years and I'd read the publisher by which was a story of Time Inc.'s founder, Henry Luce. And I was like, look, we've become too conservative. Let's go for it. And we kind of tripled our team. We all went from basically 25 employees to nearly 75. It was insane. Now, I made a lot of mistakes. One of them was just thinking that anybody can do anything, which is not true. Like, that's stupid is, is what it is. It's not true. People have strengths. People have a comparative advantage. But people can't do anything. They can do something. You know, maybe somebody can in theory do anything if they focus, if they train and all that. But I was doing 20 things at once and I hired a lot of people. Um, but the reason why I learned my lesson is because these were ultimately, I needed maybe to hire like three people, but I hired 20 people. But I also hired 20 people where given the nature of digital, there was no revenue coming in for those initiatives. You know, it was basically, we were early on YouTube. There was not a lot of competition. We recognized an opportunity and we started to create content for it. So we played, you know, there's a movie Field of Dreams in America. Uh, Kevin Costner was in it. And long story short, it's like, if you build the field, they will come to play. So that's how we built Watch Mojo. We created a catalog, we created it. People came and watched, great. I naively felt we could do that in all these other areas. But the problem was you hire these kids out of school and you're like, okay, you give them full-time jobs. You give them like, kind of like, you know, I never believed again in terms of like most respected. I always hated Condé Nast and Hearst billion dollar organizations doing these unpaid internships. So like, it was like, instead of a paid internship, these were paid employment, you know, health plans and vacation and all that. But what I realized was, my God, these kids are not necessarily entrepreneurial and they don't have the experience and we have to train them better and we have to understand they're not going to lead us to the holy grail and both create the product and create the business around it, which is what I did with Watch Mojo. We, there was no playbook. We created the playbook. But so a year or two in, I had created all these extra dependents who were not, not through any fault of their own, but they were not bringing in any revenue. We still had one or two kind of golden gooses that were paving the way for all this expansion elsewhere. But then I was like, well, this doesn't make sense. We have one thing that's really profitable right now, and that's funding all these other initiatives. But I didn't want to let people go. I felt bad. And then over time, there was some attrition where you know, somebody just wasn't necessarily creating value in the traditional sense. Like I, I, I always go, there's a difference between value and cost, right? So I was like, I appreciate these people, 
But just being fundamentally honest, there was no funding behind them. There was no client that said, okay, you know, Kraft comes on and they're going to fund a food channel. No, there was none of that. It was just us funding money losing uh, ventures and then me not having the heart to let people go. And for a period of time, even though we had tremendous retention and a great culture, we, we saw like, you know, five, 10, 15 people leave in like a, let's say a period of a year. And it gets to you as an entrepreneur when you're like, you know, is it me? Is it? And then I kind of just looked at it a bit more like at arm's length. And I said, okay, so Ash, next time be a bit more thoughtful. Don't just assume that you could hire people and everything will fall into place. So today, it's not a question of mistake or regret. I also entrepreneurs lie when they're like, if I had to do things differently, I wouldn't change anything. I would do it all the same way. I'm like, really? I would change a few things. I wish I would have ordered the other dish on, at the restaurant. You know what I mean? Like there's some things you learn in life. You wouldn't do anything differently. So today I remain as ambitious as ever, but admittedly I'm not here. I don't have a savior complex. I'm not, I mean, we created more jobs in the English media community than like, the local English newspaper and the local English, you know, broadcaster for a period of 10 years. We needed to, I wanted to, but I don't have the savior complex. I'm not here to do everything and be everything to everyone. It's like, it's got to make sense. So now when we want to pursue a venture, we actually do our homework, which I know sounds crazy, but as an entrepreneur, you know, you don't do three years of market research. We follow your gut, right? But now I'm a lot more careful. I'm a lot more thoughtful. I go, you know what? If you're going to bring people on and they don't seem entrepreneurial enough to really figure it out, and they're just going to expect you to kind of figure everything out for them. And when I say you, I mean you, the organization, you really need to be careful and be more selective. And that's stuff that a lot of entrepreneurs will not say. A lot of executives will not say because it's not, it's a bit too honest, but I really, really feel like you have to change your tactics, but not your principles. Ash, that was a hugely interesting conversation. Thank you ever so much for your time. Thank you. Appreciate the conversation.